time to bring it on. An extraordinary young man, mm -hmm. though. My goodness. Very. Well, you know what they say, life, when it throws you these kinds of things, sometimes well, makes you bitter, but often better. He rose up and got help from the Lord and kept going. All right, questions, I guess it's time. Do. Huh? It's bring it on time, Pat. Now, this go. first one is from Daniel, who says, I know all things are possible with God and that nothing is too hard for him. Can I, a 61-year-old person, get married and have healthy children and have the power to be an excellent provider in the process? I draw a lot of inspiration from the lives of Abraham and Caleb. Thanks for your counsel. Well, I think absolutely, you know, uh, you're talking to somebody who's 84, so 61, you're just a kid. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not having any children right now, but I've Thank got a you. whole I lot of grandchildren. Thank you, I about that, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 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 maybe you're going to make an announcement or something. That kind of deterred me from that <laughs> enterprise, but uh, Abraham was 100. He had a child, uh, Caleb came in and said, look, I'm 85. I'm, I'm as good as I was when I was 45. I can go in and fight wars and give me the mountain. So by all means, give you the mountain. Whether or not you're going to have children, I suspect you've still got uh, the ability to sire children. You have to, uh, women uh, run out of gas after a while. They don't have any more <laughs> eggs, you know, I, and, and so um, it, it depends. And we're okay with that. <laughs> yeah, okay. But uh, Abraham's wife was 90, and she, she came along and had a child, too. So with God, all things are possible, so take heart. But uh, if God doesn't give you a child, you can always adopt one. All right. There you go. John 15, 2, Darla says, um, it says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. She says, I take it this means that God will take Christians who don't do anything out of the picture. But how? He doesn't use them. He doesn't take them home. What does this mean with so many of his children not doing anything in his kingdom in this time of struggling? Well, I, there was one man up in uh, Seattle who said, uh, when you pray to be fruitful, you're asking for a knife. And this pruning that comes about, mm -hmm. you know, any true uh, tree is pruned. <coughs> you prune the unfruitful branches, you prune a vine, you cut them back to get them more uh, uh, fruitful. And what Jesus is saying, if you don't bear fruit, you, it, it's an uh, agricultural analogy. So you don't want to push these things any farther. But I think. Uh, if you're not bearing fruit, uh, you're not going to be part of the uh, work of the kingdom. That doesn't mean necessarily he's going to kick you out, nor does it mean he's going to kill you. It just means that, that um, your fruitfulness in the kingdom. I mean, if, if I've got a business and I have people that are dogging on the job, they're not working. Changes are they'll be fired. You know, you can't keep exactly. them. I mean, dead wood, they use the term dead wood. You can't have that because that detracts from those who are productive. And so does that mean that your employees, you're going to go out and try to kill them? No, it just means that they won't be working at your business anymore. Right. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. You won't be working on my enterprise anymore unless you start getting fruitful. All right. This is Donna Pat who says, Hi, Pat. I really look up to you and I'm hoping that you will settle an argument between my husband and me. I feel that the only reason to consume alcohol is for the purpose of some sort of buzz. My husband feels that it's fine to have a drink every night. I've asked him not to drink in front of our children as they're looking to him to see how they should live their lives. There are also alcoholics in his family, so I worry that his one drink a night could turn into more. What's your take on this subject? You know, that one drink thing, I remember some time ago being with my brother who was going to a church with a very good-looking, appealing pastor. And I was at a meeting, and that pastor said, I want a scotch and soda. Really? Yeah. So he only had one drink. But everybody in that crowd thought this put the imprimatur of the church over all of their drinking. And some of them were really heavy drinkers. Yeah. So you're dealing with alcoholism. Paul said, uh, if, if my meat causes my brother to offend, I'll eat no meat while the world stands. I think it's our, the reason that I wouldn't drink or they wouldn't drink is because you cause some weaker brother to, to uh, stumble. But in terms of uh, your husband having a glass of wine or a beer or something like that, I don't see anything that is sinful or evil about it. 
Uh, but if he's got alcoholism, let me tell you, it only takes one drink to set somebody off. Yeah. And if, if your, your drinking would destroy somebody else, I think that's the answer of why you don't do it. Mm -hmm. All right. This is Kelly Pat who says, my sister's horrible to me every day. She does things that have left emotional scars. I cry myself to sleep every night. She won't stop no matter how hard I try. I've contemplated suicide more than once. I pray constantly for a breakthrough. How can I make my sister want to be nice to me? She doesn't say how old she is. I just will say the same thing. Are I don't you, know. Are you yeah. eight? Are you 10? Are yeah, you 15? Are you, living, are you She 40? must be with her every day, so it must yeah. be a young person. Uh, I tell you what, that sister is jealous. She's jealous of you. You've got something. You're prettier, smarter, uh, more athletic, something. And she's trying to make herself look good by demeaning you. So just every time she does that, just think, all this is is a testimony of the fact that I'm better than she is, and she knows it. <laughs> I mean, that's what she's saying, that I'm jealous. <laughs> or you she know. might just be unhappy with herself. Yeah, you know? but it's the same thing, though. But she sees this uh, happy child. Begin to praise the Lord. Wherever you are, start praising God. She, she beats up on you and say, hallelujah, Jesus loves you. I mean, that will drive her crazy. And uh, at the same time, it'll give you victory. And maybe, maybe, maybe it may reform yeah. her and she'll yeah. come to the Lord. It would be really interesting to know. Kelly, you need to write and tell us how old you are. I'd be curious to yeah, know Well, that. it doesn't matter whether she's 12 or 20 or 50. <laughs> All right. Okay, this is Mrs. M who says, I've been questioning young and old about reading the Bible, and a surprising number have never been through the Bible once. These are people in the church that are saved, people as old as 86. They're listening to sermons on Christian stations. What do you say? Oh, I, I would say, would you go through life without eating? Would you try to uh, live without eating? No, you say, well, I've got to have food to nourish my body or I'll die. Well, uh, the Bible is food for the soul and for your spirit. And you need to nurture your spirit. And how does a young man cleanse his way, the Bible says, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. The Bible is for edification and uh, instruction. Uh, it, it leads us into the way of the Lord. It is a, a, a way of, of cleansing our hearts and minds. Uh, it's absolutely imperative for Christians because you, your spirit will starve. How else are you going to feed your spirit? And your spirit is the most important part of you, not your body. I mean, you can you have all these diets and all this health food and all this stuff, but what about your spirit? And the Bible is where you feed your spirit. So by all means, that's what you say, mm -hmm. okay? The word of life. All right. Well, we thank you for your questions. That's all the time we have for today.